is Hydrama going to talk smack, trash, going to talk big or small? Well, take it away, Ben, and we'll find out. So I saw Colin Quinn's small talk. For those who may not be familiar with Colin Quinn, he's an American comedian, actor, and writer, best known for his work on Saturday Night Live and Weekend Update. He's known for his commentary on social and political issues, which is what small talk centers itself around. He began his one-man show by stepping out in front of a backdrop consisting of various chalkboards. It didn't really feel applicable, and only later did I learn that it was small talk written in various ancient languages behind him. It would have been nice had he spoken to that point in his material. Immediately jumped right in, uh, starting with non-communicative expressions before talking about, of all things, small talk. Small talk, of course, being the unavoidable social interaction where individuals converse over non-trivial topics. In addition to small talk, it was heavy in cultural observations that almost everybody can relate to, including comments on American culture. He jumped between topics with little transition, and for the show billing itself on the topic of and starting off on small talk, it didn't really tie its material back together, especially at the end. So it felt a little disjointed. Um, it was overall very short and sweet uh, with a runtime of just about an hour. Um, and he's a very down to earth individual that comes across as he's speaking. And he provided a very high level of enthusiasm and authenticity. The show has been extended. So you still have through tonight, May 6th to see the show at the Greenwich House Theater. It's perfect for fans of Colin or those of a comedic routine. I give it a happy face minus. Bob Fosse's dancing is back on Broadway, but it's not quite the same as the original, which was created, directed, and choreographed by Bob Fosse. This new direction in musical staging by Wayne Salento feels quite different, especially with lighting that seems like it's out of video games and <laughs> so overexcited that often you can't see the dancers. And I think that's really so unfair when you have these magnificent dancers, these wonderful bodies that you want lighting to illuminate so we could see them and not just kind of go crazy on its own. But still any feast of two and a half hours of dancing is bound to be wonderful. And there was a lot that I really liked. I particularly liked Peter John Cherson because I think he's like a real standard um, leading man dancer who could also really act well. And then someone who you never would have seen in a Bob Fosse original, a very femboy guy wearing heels, Colton Krauss, who I guess was doing a female's role, but Fosse would, you know, it was, he was just so straight and his time was very different from ours now. So it just never would have been part of his choreography, but he was great. And, you know, I just thought I was so thankful for this evening that in spite of the things I didn't like, maybe to make it more palatable and relatable to a younger, more modern audience, this needed to be done. I still gave it a happy face, minus because of the um, newfangled stuff. Well, this I, I'm just totally frustrated, annoyed beyond anything, and it really it should not be called Bob Fosse's dancing because. Bob Fosse loved his dancer. What he had was a spotlight on the dancer and darkness all around. That was his way of doing so you could come. This is how I had to watch it with my bloody vertigo like this. <laughs> and I was just looking at the, 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 the dancer's legs and feet because trying to shut off not just the lighting, but the projections, they kept going forward like this. And then and, and it was spinning and spinning and spinning like it was like some psychedelic, like hypnotic thing. It's like, you know, excuse me, I want to look at the dancers. I don't want to look at all this bloody bells and whistles and crap you're throwing in. It's like, it was horrible. That's why like um, 
they, when they did the Fred Astaire tribute, I want to be mm. a dancing man, da, da, da. You had the whole company in silver hat and tails, and they actually left the lighting for a while, and I actually could go like, oh. <gasps> I could finally watch it, but then they came at us again. So it's like I had maybe I could watch this for five minutes, but it's I would like the modern production wanted to be on an LSD trip. Exactly, exactly. So I'm very upset that I couldn't watch this because I remember the original. I just loved it so much, and this I just hated but Colton Krauss like I said I would peek now and then because Colton Krauss I mean the way he kicked up his leg I mean he was amazing he was just phenomenal he I mean I think he should get a theater world award because he just like I, I want to follow this guy it's like I'd like to see him in the real Bob Fosse dancing because this guy was amazing the all the dancers were amazing I mean the costumes were very sexy I mean Bob Fosse would like all those sexy costumes but really truly I'm just just annoyed beyond belief. I'm giving it an unhappy face because of it. Well, J2 Spotlight is back with their season. I have already seen Candor and Ebb's Woman of the Year with the Peter Stone book, which was about career-driven Tess who ignores her husband's needs and can she have it all in 1981. It had a sparkling score and dance with superb cast, great talkback. I gave it a happy face. It closed April 23rd. But going on right now, you can see Sugar, which was the original musical version of Some Like It Hot. And then after that comes... The Goodbye Girl with Santino Fontana in the in the role. And I love it. So go check out J2 Spotlight and catch whatever they do because they bring these wonderful old musicals back to life. Oh, and speaking of which, um, Encores is also doing that. But they're doing Oliver this time around, which, you know, has been done to death. But it's still, if it gets the Encore treatment, you know it's going to be good. The Night of the Burning Pestle by Francis Beaumont is a play originally written in 1607. A farcical comedy, a love story with all sorts of twists and turns, but in the end, love triumphs over all. Today, in 2023, the base of the play remains, as does the Shakespearean sounding dialogue, and of course, the phallic humor of the play's title. But this version has a few 20th century updates mainly courtesy of the music used, or rather the parodies of the songs that are used in the play. Directed by Emily Young and Noah Brody, the play features a stellar cast of ethnically diverse, multi-talented performers whose quick wit and comedic timing make the play a joy on stage. Yes, exactly. Darius Pierce and Jesse Austrian as a grocer and his wife take over the action of the play to promote grocers and their talented friend, Paco Tolson. Teresa Aviva Lim is in love with servant Devin E. Hack, but her mom wants her to marry the rich merchant, Paul Coffey. And the parents of the servant have their own problems. Ben Steinfeld is content to sing, eat meat, and make merry with drink and song, which exasperates his humorless wife, Tatiana Wexler, who takes the jewels and cash and runs off with her favorite younger son. The cast features Royer Bacchus in the supporting role, playing multiple characters, one of which is a horse. Miss Bacchus showcases her ability to take on every character and make it uniquely her own. Tina Chilp as the mother who wants her daughter to marry the rich man she's picked out for her is hysterical. She also plays the part of the innkeeper's wife and she does so to perfection. The rest of the cast is equally magnificent. There isn't a weak link in the bunch. Special kudos to Paco Tolson as the Knight of the Burning Pestle who keeps the audience laughing so hard we cry. Happy face. Oh, yes, I totally agree with the happy face. I mean, it was it was like fourth wall breaking fourth wall. It was just delightful and funny and just you'll have the best, most rollicking evening of your life. So I'm giving it a major happy face, too. Sasha Clark went to the Paper Mill Playhouse to see Agatha Christie's Murder on the Orient Express, and this is her review. 
The opening crowd at the Paper Mill Playhouse was ready for a special treat, and they got it with this beautiful production of Ken Lodwig's adaptation of Agatha Christie's classic tale of murder on the Orient Express. As always, Beowulf Board's elaborate design provides the backdrop for the initial setting in exotic Istanbul, and then the luxurious accommodations on board the train. After the opening scene, in which Hercule Poirot, our hero, of course, introduces himself and the story, he then runs into the man who is the head of the train company. Woo! Subsequently, all the characters are introduced as they board the train and then either tell a bit about themselves to the conductor who checks them in or to Boos, who stops by to greet some of the celebrities of the day as they arrive. Shortly, the train and the audience are on their way. Despite a short pause for technical difficulties, it seems the train has some opening night jitters, <laughs> which the production staff handled beautifully. The journey continued. Soon there is a murder. This is a murder mystery, after all. And Hercule Poirot leaps into action. As with all Ken Lundvig shows, there was a well-choreographed door-slamming bit with actors entering and exiting small compartments on the train. The tightly designed quarters made for some other fun physical comedy bits along the way. Karen, the entire production is beautifully designed with exquisite costumes by Maria and Zalda Hale and excellent hair and wig design by Carissa Thorixton. Karen Ziemba stood out as, what else, a great actress. The experienced cast made a tight-knit ensemble and left enough reasonable doubt with each character to keep the audience guessing until the end. Unless, of course, you've read the book or seen the original black and white movie or seen the updated, more recent movie or seen the PBS version or any of the other versions they have. The musical selections between the scenes were well-chosen and enhanced the European setting and the era of the action. As always, the paper mill provides a wonderful selection for New Jersey locals and is easily accessible for people from New York as long as you don't take the wrong train as well. But now, for people like me, they provide a free shuttle bus from the train station before the show to the station after the show. It is easier than ever to get there. Do treat yourself to this fun evening out. Sasha gives it a happy face plus and... Leonard is going to see it on April 30th, so his follow-up review will also show up on Facebook. Henry Luz, Jonathan Sayer, and Henry Shields have written Peter Pan Goes Wrong, which is the same people, I guess, that did the play that goes wrong. Only this time, they've taken the story of Peter Pan, and oh, you can imagine how the, the, the scenery, the people, the lies all over the place. I mean, Ben, you go into more detail. Peter Pan Goes Wrong is as delightful and comical as the name implies. Fans of the play that goes wrong will welcome this follow-up presentation by Mischief Theater. It is the classic story of Peter Pan, but with twists and turns throughout its two-hour runtime. From the moment I took my seat, my aisle was occupied by a panic stagehand with a hammer in hand, interacting with fellow audience members. This set the tone for the show that was to come, as the pre-show provided audience members with an immersive experience. There's no moment spared of comedy and unfortunate mishaps in this production. <laughs> Characters get stuck and injured, props get switched out, costume fails. Even the Playbill program is in on the joke. It speaks to an unfortunate accident involving the real life crocodile. The rest of the cast is equally talented and energetic and they all barely get a moment to breathe and they leave with bruises each night just due to the physical demanding nature of the comedic timing and performance. They are nonstop with costume changes. Nancy Zemit, who plays Tinkerbell, the mother and the nanny alone is constantly running around switching between different roles. The narrator is currently played by Neil Patrick Harris now through May 7th, and he adds a familiar face and magical flair to the show. I would recommend you see this show if you're a fan of slapstick comedy and improv but stay away from it if you're true to the Peter Pan story or expecting a classic play. Also, you get a lot of backstage stuff going on too. It's the, the kind of colors what's going on on stage as, a, as various affairs and romances are revealed and relatives of people are revealed. So it's that also adds the whole hilarity of it all. The set is designed very well. It has Big Ben, it has Neverland. It's built on a turntable, which provides occasionally seamless transitions 
and humorous portrayals of multiple events at the same time. The cast and crew also function as puppeteers, much like we've discussed with Life of Pi. Um, puppets that glow in the dark. Uh, overall, the show is just brilliantly and creatively done. Um, I'm giving too much away just now as I speak, so just stop listening to us and go get yourself over to the Barrymore Theater to see this show. Big happy face plus for me. I was just on the floor from beginning to end. I mean, I had to watch it like uh, like this because I was like on the floor so much. So I'm giving this such a happy thing. Ah, it's nice to have a laugh now and then. Yasmin Reza's God of Carnage is now being done by Theaters Breaking Through Barriers. And it shows the, under the veneer of civilized behavior lies savagery. Veronica and Michael have invited Annette and Alan over to discuss the fact that Annette, Annette and Alan's son beat their kid with a stick, causing him to break two teeth and expose a nerve in another tooth. Veronica had drafted a statement about the incident for the perusal and approval of Annette and Alan, who will, of course, provide their own statement. Veronica is doing her best to take the high moral ground, but her husband appears to placate the other side. Alan is a corporate lawyer who is constantly on the phone trying to defuse some pharmaceutical concerns over a drug that could be harming people. His wife is very annoyed at Alan for constantly being on that phone. Pretty soon we learn all sorts of unpleasant actions on both husbands' parts and the wives start to band together against the husbands and then it turns into a free-for-all. I was liking this play a lot when I saw it on Broadway as Alfie was roughly of that age so I could relate to the parents more. This time I found this show slow and building at the beginning and it was a bit tedious and it get, didn't get going till the gloves came off. And I realized this was necessary to make the descent into how more pronounced, but still the pace needs to be picked up more. This is not a pinter play that requires pauses. However, the acting was very good. Christine mm -hmm. Noll, who is an exceptional singer, easily captured the rhythm of the play. She tried to maintain calm. Gabe Fazio had a tendency to favor bro over spouse, which causes some issues. David Burke is a soulless monster who only cares about the bottom line and doesn't seem to think too much of his kid. Carrie Cox feels caught in the middle of it all, and finally her maternal instincts kick in for kid and animal alike, and she goes from mousy to roaring lioness. It's a very admirable play that is very relevant in today's contentious atmosphere. I give it a mixed face plus. Jake Goldbass is back with High Drama, and this is his first review with us. Richard Plotz's The Country Play concerns Michael Turner, a recently retired professor. Turner inherits a country estate from his deceased father and over a summer of life changes, invites his nuclear and extended families to the estate. Michael thinks his retirement and countryside escape from New York City will grant him time to finally write the great American novel. Michael's extended family is large and the production's seven other characters are well-developed and at any given time given to superficial arguments. Writer Pr Richard Plotz makes nods and allusions to romance novels of the 19th century. Plotz plays says as much when the Generation Z character Antonia and the millennial Generation Kevin joke that they may as well be in a Russian novel. Plotz intentionally embellishes the grandiloquence of his characters such that Stan Bertia's sonorous baritone makes poetry out of trimming the hedges. That the play frustratingly does not go for drama is not a glitch and may in fact be a feature. Attempts at consequential drama such as will Michael finish his great American novel or will Antonia run away with her cousin on a trip to Africa instead of fulfilling her responsibilities to go to Yale University are quickly shrugged off just as easily as they are instigated or initiated. Millennial proxy Kevin Turner, expertly played by Matt Corey, is successful enough to finish medical school and get accepted into Doctors Without Borders, but he can't complete a song on his guitar without going into a philosophical existential crisis and panic attack. At that point, as a millennial male, I said, okay, fair enough. That's a portrait of yours truly, whether I like it or not.
This is a hangout play where the viewer is meant to just chill and check out some characters. As befitting a play about the country, this work is campy, and as a discerning art critic must conclude, better camp than kitsch. And he gives this a happy face plus. Lolita Chakrabarty, sorry, I'm going to be mangling names like crazy, has adapted Jan Martel's best-selling novel for the stage, Life of Pi. Now, Pi, played brilliantly by the young Hiren Abayasekera, who's gotten like gazillion nominations and awards in England. He's amazing. He is the sole survivor of a shipwreck. Mr. Okamoto and Lulu Chen are trying to get to the bottom of what happened to the ship and everyone on it for an insurance claim. Pai sets up the story of his family of a mother, father, and sister who run the local zoo, which had a gorilla, zebra, hyena, and deadly tiger, and other animals. They had to flee to Canada when things got too dangerous to stay there in India, and they took their animals with them. That is how Pi ended up in a lifeboat with a gorilla, zebra, hyena, and deadly tiger. Thus begins his harrowing tale of survival in a survival of the fittest story. The puppets were remarkable and such three-dimensional figures that they seemed very real and frightening, especially Richard Parker, the tiger. This is an incredible story of how a person copes with something so traumatic and makes it possible to go on. I got so caught up in the story that I forgot I was in a theater. I was right there on that boat with Pi. I absolutely loved this. It was just to me one of the best things I've, I've ever seen on stage. And I'm not sure it was a gorilla or ape, so that, I mean, but it was some sort of large monkey. I found it to be one of the most visually stimulating pieces of theater that I've ever seen. The special effects are outstanding between the lighting design, uh, between the staging of the boat, uh, the puppetry. And one of the things too, that's just incredible is watching fellow cast members transform into puppeteers. Um, and you can just imagine the physical demanding labor that goes into operating each puppet for them to be on their knees and in uncomfortable positions to really transform into these animals on stage. Um, think Lion King-like spectacle on a whole different level with what these animals are. With an um, incredible story at the heart of it that just completely right. grabs you by the throat and heart and body and soul. Absolutely, yeah. So between the projections and between um, just the, the the real hard work that the cast is pouring into the show, uh, it is very creatively well done. Uh, easy to see why Eva felt like she was on the boat with Pi. Um, and very sweet and how it all ties together at the end as well uh like i felt myself laugh and have a big smile on my face i was worried it was just going to be a uh replica of the film uh but it totally held its own um and created one of the best shows of the season you don't even have to have seen the movie to appreciate this and i took a famous puppeteer with me theodora skipateros and she was just like bowled over by the puppets too i mean they they really i mean this whole story and i mean i didn't remember the movie so i was still it was like all fresh to me so i cannot recommend this enough this is so incredible so i'm giving this beyond happy faith yeah happy faith plus for me The second play that I reviewed this week for High Drama was Welcome to Clown Town, playing at the Tank Theater over by Madison Square Garden on 36th. And uh, Welcome to Clown Town was written and performed by Tanya Perez and directed and co-produced by the director Lorca Perez. And by the spellings of their names, we know they're not related. Tanya invented a character, Pixie the Clown, and the play is a one-woman solo act. I thought this play was also well done, and the Pixie the Clown enters a sort of redemption from cynicism. So we know from popular culture that cynical clowns are all over the place so we have in my review on high drama on facebook you can read how i compared this play to crusty the clown on the simpsons or 
Bad Santa, which was in movie theaters uh, in 2003 and its sequel in 2016. I ultimately think that Perez achieved something greater than what popular culture often alludes to, but does not claim, which is a redemption from that cynicism. And that's why I gave this play a happy face plus. And some other stuff going on that I'd like to mention is that Tamara Tooney will be interviewed by Theater Mania Editor-in-Chief and President of OCC, David Gordon, for the League of Professional Theater Women's Oral History at the New York Public Library for the Forming Arts on May 17th at 1 o'clock. The Dreamer, A Midsummer's Night Dream, as seen through the sleepy eyes of a young girl, is going to be here until May 7th. And also going on until May 7th is Telling Tales Out of School, where Woody King Jr.'s new federal theater presents four women writers of the Harlem Renaissance at Castilla Theater, featuring former guest Richarda Abrams. All right, there's a very interesting uh, tour going on right now called A Gaga's Guide to the Lower East Side. Uh, Linwood McLean was filled the tour guide. And he was uh, Sammy Shade from Let's Make Up, some mythical reality show he was on. He keeps going on about that in his feud with Perez Hilton, who came into prominence in 2006 as a celebrity gossip blogger. But when he's not doing all that part, which I found boring, he, he talks about Gaga and how where she lived and she was part of the Lower East Side, which I didn't know about. I live on the Lower East Side. It was so nice to hear about all the history. I mean, Gershwin lived there. So it's a very interesting thing to check out. There'll be more on our next show, May 20th, where me and Sasha Clark will talk about it. But in the meantime, it is award season, and the Lucille Lotel Awards will be May 7th at 7 p.m. at the um, Michael Schimmel Building, oh, you know, by Washington Square Park. And the Drama League Awards will take place May 19th at noon at the Zigfield Ballroom. And there's going to be a very special gala concert for Amas on Monday, May 15th at 6 o'clock, where they're going to be doing a reading of O. Henry, the music of Henry Krieger, and it's directed by Bill Russell, and it's featuring a whole bunch of your favorite theater people. And then they're going to honor, with the Rosie Award, Cheryl Lee Ralph, who not is just an Abbott Elementary, but we know her from Dream Girls. That girl's got pipes, let me tell you. So, yeah, there's a lot going on in May. May, the May, the lofty month of May. And we'll talk about Camelot at some point. Have a good time and see you May 20th.